to hear I us. Can hear a thing. Can you hear me, Siri? Can you hear me? Yes. I can't hear you. Yeah. Can everybody everybody hear me? Can't hear a word. Nothing. Can you, can you hear us, Joanna? Hmm. Um, oh my! Everyone else can hear me. Yes. I can't hear a word. Okay. All right. Maybe it's me. Maybe my. Yeah, I, I think don't know. it's you. I can't hear anything. Um, let me just give you a two-minute uh, bit on my background. Nope, I'm uh, not hearing a thing. Uh, uh, hear you and everyone else hears me. <laughs> okay, so we're going to continue. I have to continue <laughs> or else we're not going to get anything done. Uh, I come from Boston, uh, but I've been living in China for 30 years. I can't um, hear anything. Uh, I'm simply not part of this conversation. Uh, how shall we get you in? I, th I think the problem is on your end. I hear everything you say loud and clear. Joanna? Mm -hmm. Here she goes. I think she's going to try and come back in. Okay, very quickly, we're going to fill some time here. I am normally I'm based in China. I left China during COVID. I went back to Boston. This is the longest I've been in the United States since 1986. I've been here since August 1st, 2020. I it's you know it's my my business is a little bit upside down, but we're still operating out of Hong Kong. We have an exhibition up right now, believe it or not, of contemporary art from Iran uh, with an Iranian curator who brought the work from Tehran. So we do have a very global approach to everything we do, whether it's in Hong Kong, Beijing, or in an art fair in Paris or an art fair in New York. To me, it's all sort of a global conversation. I am just back from the L.A. art fairs. We drove up the West Coast, and now we're in Seattle seeing friends. That's me in a nutshell. <laughs> so I, I'm more interested in hearing about all of you and what you're doing with your various practices. I've talked a little bit to Siri. I haven't had a chance to talk to everyone else. Claire, you want to tell us what what's happening in Chicago? It's cold. Um, um, are, are we going to show some images or um, just As talk? As you like. I mean, I, I'm interested in this question, this broad question given to us by the organizers about okay. who gets okay. to decide what's art? Who gets to decide what's what's art? What's the, you know, what's Okay, the we'll get to that. I'm, I'm, uh, I live in Chicago. I've been here for 25 years teaching at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And I have an active practice um, as a writer and an artist. I just had an article come out in Art in America yesterday um, about bio art. And my work has been about our relationship to the rest of the natural world. I uh, did a lot of work about soil because I had studied food systems. And the key to growing food without poisons is to take care of your soil and manage the life in your soil. Um, and I've done things about um, the affective or emotional level of the, what we call the Anthropocene, which kind of covers climate change, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, cultural diversity loss, et cetera. Very interesting, very timely, my God. And you've been doing that for many years? 
Oh yeah, about about thirty years uh, since I lived in New York before I came to Chicago. And how does that translate into your classwork? I'm just curious. I, what courses are you teaching right now? Well, actually, I'm in the midst of a retirement process, um, so I am not teaching this semester. I finished all my teaching last semester, um, but I was. I was stationed in a photography department um, and there was a period where I did use photography in a lot of different ways, but I got disenchanted and also um, put off by the toxicity of most of the photographic processes. Um, oh, interesting. And just the fact that we're just drowning in images. I just couldn't see yeah. making another photograph. Um, after a while. I'll tell you a quick story. Have you ever heard of Silvermine Photography? I'll send you a link. The reason it's called Silvermine is because a friend of mine in Beijing, a French guy, he found a, a photo salon full of negatives. And the guy was, you know, collecting the negatives so he could strip the silver off and sell the silver. He didn't give a damn about, you know, what was on the negative. He only wanted to strip and make money off the silver or whatever the chemical that's left on the negative. And this French photographer, uh, dealer, editor, friend of mine, he bought up you know, a mountain of negatives and basically has now been reprinting them. And there are, of course it's vernacular photography, but somehow I think it's nice that he sort of saved it from the rubbish heap where it probably would have stayed for the next hundred years. But, uh, uh, so he's printing all of these sort of vernacular photos he, he's getting out of this and other photo salons in China. But yeah, photography is a tough, a tough nut to crack. Very tough. So you're in the middle of retiring and, and what are you going to do when you retire? Do you know? Oh, can't hear you either. Cannot hear you. Johan, can you hear me? Johan, can you hear me? Yeah. What is going on? No, I can hear you, but it's Julian, the name, and I can hear you, yes. Okay. Ju How do you pronounce it? Say it again. Ju you can pronounce it as Jul Julian or Johan. Oh, no, that's actually Julian. my second name. Julian. Johan. So yeah. you were pretty right there. Sorry. That's one of my <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, Julian, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's happening and what are you doing in Portland and how did you get involved in this conference? Well, I don't know about the last question, the latter question. <laughs> I, I, I just got invited and I said, sure, why not? That was, I'm here the second time. Last year I was here too. Um, why am I important? Well, because I fell in love with this woman in Italy. And um, she is a neuroscientist and, and she was looking into mouse brains. And I was intrigued by her and her work, which involved proteins. At that point, I was a physicist and then switched into making protein sculptures. So that's kind of a long, convoluted love story. And I'm still here. We have four kids now and um, we're still together. She's cooking tonight. Bravo. So like, yeah. Well done. Interesting. Interesting. Very interesting. And what is a protein sculpture? How, how do you well, define a protein okay, sculpture? So, so I, I basically, I was into printmaking and, 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 and drawing and painting when I was young. And so then I got all hooked up to, to physics and I spent eight years at universities, did my graduate research and all that stuff because I was intrigued by quantum physics. But when I, when I left that, I, I, I knew I went to the US and I knew I wanted to do art. I just didn't know what, and it was, it was kind of like colorless, what I had done before. So I got into 3D for the first time in my life. And because I was so intrigued with these protein structures, which are, imagine them as, as, the, as the building blocks of life, basically. You have DNA, it's a one-dimensional strand, it gets translated into a sequence of amino acids. Because of their physical properties, those fold into space. And those three-dimensional objects, if you want to call them that, make everything in the machinery and the structure of life. So the way for life to go from, from one-dimensional information on the DNA to three-dimensional bodies, the smallest mm -hmm. step in that. Um, and so one of my first projects was that I took the scientific data of these atoms in space 
of the backbone mm -hmm. of the amino acids in space and turned them into a cutting instructions to make a mitered cut sculpture. So if you take a piece of wood, you do a 45 degree <laughs> angle, you flip it, and then you have a 90 degree angle when you glue it back together. So that's uh -huh. such an elegant and beautiful way that I felt th this would be awesome to make, to, to map 3D structure into, into, into sculptures. And that's, that's how I started out. Interesting. The, yeah, I feel like I need, I do need an image of e something from each of your practices. Yeah, I, know I can pull I one up if you want to share the screen, but I don't know if that makes sense right now. Yes, yes. Why don't you pull one up? In, sure. in the meantime, why don't we go to Siri while you guys are, uh, and Claire, if also, if you don't mind, it would be nice to pull up an image of whatever you want. <laughs> And Siri, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Certainly. Um, I'm a photographer, an artist, an educator. I've been teaching for almost two decades. Um, I live in Los Angeles. I'm originally from Maine. And I, yeah, I mean, these are all questions that I really grapple with a lot. Like, why photography? What is the point when we're inundated with so many images? You know, to me, it always comes down to connection. You know, all my work deals with connection. A lot of my practice has focused primarily on portraiture. Um, and now I am working on a large, it's actually a 30-year project that um, will come out in a book form, in book form in 2023 or early 2024 about my family. Um, so, yeah, and you can see some of my works behind me just in terms of color. <laughs> Color is very important to me, thinking about, you know, how do we communicate? How do we, how do we see what another person sees? I mean, this is a question that I grapple with all the time. You know, if I'm photographing another person, what's their experience like? I, it matters to me a lot, you know, how to share that, how to share that kind of meaning. Um, so I think, you know, to, to sort of take up one of the, the questions that, the other participants are mentioning. I don't know how I was invited to this conference, but I think <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. Um, but I'm happy to be. And I do think it's interesting that there's some photographers and scientists, you know, it's it's very multimedia in terms of the approach that they've taken in to, to curating the participants. Um, but yeah, for me, it really just comes down to connection and perception, you know, the, the different ways that we perceive. Um, so I originally, I, I lived in Italy for five years and I have a master's in Italian. And to me, it's, you know, I was thinking about these questions, the, the kind of prompts and thinking about translating, the act of translating to me is very akin to an artist, you know, as an artist, when I make my work, how does someone else see it? How do they experience it? You know, it's, it's, such a strange process, right? And did you find that, you know, that there's a different approach in Italy to your photography, a different reaction? When I lived in Italy, I didn't do photography. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was studying literature at the University of Florence, and that was a completely different life. <laughs> uh, nice. I sort of took some photos here and there as a hobby. Um, and I will actually, some of those will be in my book. So it, I was doing some black and white. So, you know, black and white or color, it's like, it's, you know, it's and, just different. And Claire color. was talking about the problem, which is real of, you know, the toxicity and the reprints mm -hmm. and the mass production. Uh, and how do you deal with that? Like, were you printing photographs in Italy and the United States? Or you told me, I think you you know, you're very careful about your printing. Yeah, I'm a film photographer. You know, I don't love the toxicity of it. I primarily am a color photographer. Color to me is just, I, I, it just brings me joy. It's a, it's a joy-based decision. Yeah. Hi! <laughs> it's like magic. Here he is. <laughs> a, lot of work. a lot of work, but I'm here. You I'm made here. it! <laughs> Hi, everyone. Very exciting. We get, almost gave up on you. <laughs> Thank you for sticking with it. Listen, I, I'm, I was hell bent. I'm in Sweden right now and it's 4 a.m. I'm here for it. I was working. Wow. Yep. Wow. You're very courageous. More yeah, courageous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we just sort of were introducing everybody to each other. And Siri was telling us a little bit. We were talking about the problem of photography and the fact that uh, you know, everyone has their sort of different interpretation of how to use the, the mediums. 
but there's also an element of toxicity with photography, with the materials of developing your own, uh, just the develop the chemical process actually breeds toxicity. So how do you, how do you grapple with that? And Siri and Claire were telling us, you know, it's something I always like, you know, I always think about my life as a whole and sort of the, all of the choices I make and how they can kind of offset, you know, yes, I do shoot film. So the developing and the production of the film is, is a bit toxic, but then I've been a vegetarian for 46 years. So, you know, for example, I always think to myself, okay, that not, I'm not in any kind of judgmental way at all. My husband and son eat meat. But, I, you know, I think to myself, okay, well, that offsets quite a bit of production there. Or, you know, thinking holistically about it. Um, you know, it is something that concerns me. It's just I'm very attached to my film. <laughs> the materiality of it is, is just so dear to me. It's, it, I can't quite give it up. <laughs> Claire, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. Oh, you're muted. No, can't hear you. Derek, can you hear Claire? I, I can. I came in and I kicked Claire out. That's what happened. No, we've been having these problems all along. I don't know why. Oh, no. I think she's going to try and come back in and that will be easier. In the meantime, Derek, do you want, want to sort of let us know what you think about uh, what you're up to? First of all, you're a professor. You're in Sweden. <laughs> yeah. So I just finished a performance at um, Moderna Musse, uh, who was created by Hendrik Volkerts, who was at the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, it's, it was called a, a gay bar um, everywhere. I'm actually exhausted because we did a four hour performance, but I wanted to be here. Um, it was sort of an improvisational performance with, uh, I think, 12 different queer artists um, that we'd only known each other for two days and sort of developed this performance together. And actually, my practice works very well into that because I'm oftentimes trying to navigate some type of performative queer space that um, navigates pleasure and does not feel laborious. And so for me, um, uh, thinking too much ahead of time or the work being production-based or labor-based is quite against the way in which I work now. Um, and so oftentimes uh, the process in the work functions as the way the work works. Mm -hmm. um, so dialogue becomes the function for a lot of work or performance becomes the function for a lot of the work that might output a product. Um, and I think that's a way of me also mitigating some of the dialogue that's happening between folks here, which is like, I think we're acknowledging that there's like no way out of capitalism, that the structure in fact is fraught with a lot of the issues, right? And so if someone is saying, hey, I am a vegetarian, also I shoot film and I'm saying, hey, I know I'm in the art market, but I've chosen specifically in my life right now to not make a ton of prod product-based photography and performance and sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, so I teach at RISD um, and I currently uh teaching yay RISD. yay RISD. <laughs> um i went to saic where claire was one of my professors um, mm -hmm. so, um i teach in three departments sculpture painting textiles between all three nice. of them i'm currently teaching in an erotics ambiguities problematics uh performance and film-based pornography course which is inspired by Barbara de Genevieve. Um, mm -hmm. And I pitched this class when I took the interview for RISD. I'm also teaching an advanced critical studies course, which is a critical theory course. And I am also- RISD, the last course, the critical theory is RISD also? Is RISD also. And I teach an interdisciplinary studio course, which for the, in general, RISD is very siloed. Mm. And so I bring students from around the institution together. And it's not the first of its kind. The pornography course is more of the first of its kind. Um, but this sort of style of interdisciplinary critique is kind of the first of its kind as well. Um, and trying to sort of bridge the silo gap at the institution, which SAIC is not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is this, like a visiting professor gig in Sweden? Uh, nope, I'm just here for a few days for the performance. Uh 
Uh, and so the performance happened and I have to return back because I teach on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Wow. Did you literally stand on the stage for four hours? Yep. <laughs> I performed. Um, actually, my performance was actually much more about rest and pleasure. So for much of the performance, I laid on a mattress. Nice. <laughs> Four hours is a long time without a break in the middle. My goodness. Oh, we did have an intermission. Uh, oh, I was okay. last, <laughs> again, it was 12 different artists. So I was the last act before intermission and the first act after intermission. But <laughs> we were sort of active in each other's micro performances. Nice. And then is there audience feedback? Blah, blah. blah. Is, is that how it works when you get done? or? Um, in the case of my part of the performance, the audience was integral in, in my section. Uh, I began reading, um, a, a, a poem or a text that centered around, um, dialogues I've been considering around sexual pleasure, uh, opacity, um, and transparency. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I then asked the crowd to, um, uh, what is the task? if pleasure is the only ask was the prompt. Mm -hmm. And then they responded uh, during intermission and then they came down and they basically clipped these to my face in a fetish hood. Mm -hmm. And I basically uploaded their pleasure into my body and then I output it onto the mattress mm -hmm. for my first painting that I've ever created before. I'm mostly a photographer too, performance. Mm -hmm. But so then I developed my first painting improvisationally through the audience input. Wow. I, I can see why you're exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I'm here, I'm here. I, I can't pretend I did anything remotely like that today. <laughs> oh God, that's wonderful. Thank you. And has, a, do you get a positive response at RISD to, from, your, from the students? Yeah, they're starved. The institution has a, the, um, you know, we're redefining what BIPOC and POC is right now. But mm -hmm. we between between Asian students, Black students, and Brown students, they make up sixty to seventy percent of the population, whereas the uh, professor population is like ninety percent white. And so, for I came in with a cohort of ten other Black artists, thinkers, theorists. Um, mm -hmm in the institution who all have named professorships and are critical review track. They don't have tenure at RISD, but their, their version is critical review. Um, it would be like very young and be in that position is great, but the students are starved. So they mess, they email me 24 seven to have dialogues because they, they haven't had black queer professors look at their artwork and I'm very excited. Wow. Wow. That's a, that's a, a worse prior situation than I imagine. Yeah, everyone thinks RISD is a little bit more on the ball. I mean, from the outside. Huh. Yeah, no, I think all institutions have their issues. I think RISD has a lot of them the same way. They develop a lot of labor-based practices, very Protestant um, labor-based practices. And so students learn um, oftentimes not how to think or conceive or conceptualism. They They can produce anything. Students can make everything. We have contracts with the biggest companies in the world, but it comes their senior year and they've got to develop a thesis and they have no idea what they're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's tricky. I was just, uh, before you joined, I was saying that I started this trip. I'm in Boston normally. Hear my accent come out. Uh, actually Cape Cod. So my accent is really messed up and I lived 30 years in China. So you know, you'll hear all my weird accents. But uh, so we drove, we went to the LA art fairs and then we drove up to Seattle. I'm in Seattle now. And it, this gets to what you're saying because we stopped to see these old friends of mine in Santa Cruz and they're British and they're uh, doing a professor residency at UC Santa Cruz. And I was sort of, you know, dying to hear. And you probably know one is Isaac Julian and his partner, Mark Nash, who's, you know, and I haven't really had a chance to sit down with them since they moved to Santa Cruz. I know them in London and China. And uh, it was just funny to see them sort of having to grapple with an American, especially California. You know, they, they did use the word chaotic. but 
but they're staying. I mean, they're enjoying it. Uh, they're enjoying being there as artists in residence and also as professor. So, I mean, I think it's really a challenge to be part of any institution uh, in this day and age. It's really a challenge. You know, you, so much of your time is spent up not on your art practice, but on everything else that sort of sucks up your time. I mean, it's a it's a noble cause to be in the education field. It's uh, it's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. So, th did you say this is the second conference you've done with this group, Derek? Is this the second? Oh, the oh, Ju uh, Julian said it was the second. So, what was Julian? He's in Portland over here. What uh, what was the con the, the subject, the topic in your last conference? God, but it was something about shared <laughs> humanity. Oh, yeah. how can art foster a shared humanity yeah i think all these topics are how are we going to save the world you know i'm i'm, <laughs> I'm sorry you know this is my dark humor uh, this is what happens when you spend the last 30 years living in china you have a very <laughs> twisted humor <laughs> but, but uh, this one is not about saving the world right it's no, no this one, do you, Meg, do you know what this one's about? Yes, yes, yes. It's really, I took it to mean how do we define what is good art and that all the categories have shifted and who gets to decide, obviously, is a big question. And from whose perspective and, you know, how do we even begin to come to a common definition of doesn't matter if it's the medium or, you know, the perspective. I mean, I, I can give you the example. I'm always running into this example. There was a big exhibition on Chinese contemporary art a while ago that was at a museum in the United States was traveling around, and I thought it made no sense whatsoever. Completely irrelevant to anything happening in China at the moment. And I think that happens a lot, the sort of cultural confusion, two ships passing in the night, people just sort of give lip service, they get seducted by the art market, and they sort of lose sight of, well, what, you know, what, what are people really talking about in the art world once the, you know, once the sort of uh, the hype goes away and how and what's what's sort of the common areas the last time I was on, I did, this is the second conference I've done with these guys. The first conference was fun because we basically were talking during the COVID to an artist in Jakarta, the Philippines, Singapore, KL, Kuala Lumpur, and myself on the East Coast and, and, one art, and another Chinese artist in California. So it was sort of, you know, this very... Asian perspective, and everyone had a totally different perspective. It was good. Uh, See, I think that is the point. I mean, I think that actually with art, art is a place where values are debated. And um, it's, it's not up to anybody to decide to be the one who is who is um, kind of brokering that value for everybody else. It's a discussion. It's a, um, it's a place where people's different perceptions, where the, the difference can be explored rather than just kind of looking for, oh, well, what's the lowest common denominator? And I think that um, actually art is, is, is a very fertile place for difference to be explored and difference the appreciation of difference is um an almost an urgent issue now uh because um of the kind of cultural monopolies that that we have going on yeah yeah uh yeah, I mean, I, I think I've, I've gotten used to being the other, you know, and that <clears throat> I always say is a very good thing. Everyone needs to live sometime in their life in a place where they're the minority. I mean, it sounds simple, but it's not. <laughs> and it's really important, that, you know, that you, you sort of not just visit, that you actually live and have to function in those kind of uh, environments. I used to always say, it's very important to live in a place, try and exist in a place where you're 
in the minority, and everyone in the United States should visit a prison at least once in their life. I, shame on anyone who's never stepped inside a prison in America, because then, then you will shut up on every issue, every political issue for the rest of your life. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that's, that's, I have taught in the prison. <laughs> I've I've taught in the prison. Here Claire, and are you taught in prison? Yeah, and I have not shut up on every political issue in my life. Yeah. I, th I think it's really, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm very sensitive to sort of the, the us telling the rest of the world what to do. But uh, uh, yeah, prisons, I think I, it's just, a, you know, the, the never ending problem when I'm in, uh, yeah, I've, I've been in a lot of prisons in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. I used to be a lawyer. That's why. So uh, yeah, it's, it's not pretty. Claire, I, I have, I have much love for what you said about art. Uh, mm. I, I feel similarly. I mean, I, I, I think it would be crazy to, 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 for someone to decide, right? Like that's the whole reason of postmodernism. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, it's, I mean, I hate to say it, right? Like the reason there is no more Clement Greenberg, you know what I mean? I, I like walked <laughs> across, across the stage during her Lifetime Achievement Award at the CAA one year. Like, I'm just like, the reason the vanguards are gone is because like we, the work in itself should be about difference and the way in which different people can approach it. And I, and and for me, it's like art and visual culture, there's no real delineation. I'm unsure even if that is correct, but the only constant is like art is, an, is aesthetic in nature. Like in, in that thing, I don't know that I also want aesthetic to mean sensory. Like yeah, in some, it's right? like, like, like it's, uh, it's the whole human sensorium basically is and like, the way we metabolize and make meaning from it, our in many different directions you know mm -hmm. i completely agree i mean i i think you know just to touch on what meg was saying about everyone should live somewhere else i mean obviously if they you know given different conditions if they can but it's you know the the whole getting back to that idea of translating as i was thinking about the the prompt i was I kept going back to that because to me, it really is, that was my initial, you know, academic training was in comparative literature. So I always was thinking about translating how you go from this language to that. And to me, it's really seamless with art. I mean, it's, it's just a, a sort of framework for living. And it, it's sort of like a moral code, I suppose, in a way it's thinking always, how is this other person experiencing the world? How can I experience it? And how can I engage with that? How can I connect? Um, and to me, that's what art is. You know, it really comes back to that experience. I've written connecting. some things. I've written some things and I said, we've been so conditioned to see art and its modalities in very specific ways. As we reconfigure our vision, it is best to enter a world full of wonder with kind approach, asking more questions rather than seeking what we already believe we know as validation. And I think that that is like what art should do in the way in which art should be entered. As I, yes. you know, like even someone who is trained as an artist comes with a specific background of tools that you've learned from an yeah. institute or an academy. But with that being said, you could, I think early on I would see things and I would then try to judge them based off of the academy. And instead I had asked uh, myself to be more imaginative and ask more questions of the work to develop a, a more kind or empathetic and also open idea of what a structure of aesthetic or sensory sensorium can be. Um, mm -hmm. And that's been really generative for me and is, is sort of gives me a greater appreciation for just like everything in the world. Yeah, well, you're also, I think each of you are very articulate about your practice. And, you know, this is always a difficult question. Who gets to write the artist's, you know, story, who gets to write the artist's truth and how it can get sort of misinterpreted. I mean, it, it sometimes it is pretty much a Rorschach test for, you know, the writer. And uh, we know, I think we all know the problematic world of art writing uh, and how so many things are subject to misinterpretation. And uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, whether I was thinking about uh, Faith Ringgold at the new museum and you know here is this lady what is she 90 91 i forget 
91. And everyone, you know, in New York, everyone knows her. Everyone's had an encounter with her. Everyone's, you know, been to her studio. Everyone's been her part-time employee. So everyone has a different interpretation of this lady. And it's almost funny to hear, you know, everyone sort of reinvent Faith Ringgold. And at the end, you're like, well, who, what is, who is Faith Ringgold? You know, she's, uh, it's really interesting to how people sort of communicate their own practice for me is always uh, interesting. I always uh, want the artist to write a little something, you know, even if it's only one paragraph, I tell you, you know, it's, I think part of being in this business is you're hungry to hear the artist's voice. Like what does the artist want to say? You know, this is like the starting gate that we, everyone has to get out of. Uh, but be. I don't think the I don't think the artist has the final word on on the on what the art means. I mean, it's art is an invitation mm. to participate in meaning making and to propose different possible interpretations and to propose many interpretations because that's uh, generative. That that gets our brains going in several directions. But Claire, as best as I can, all of my students like watch Art 21s because I don't I like they we can't just mediate them through articles that people have written work about. Like I need the artists to speak for themselves as all. Well, possible. no, it is one voice that is that is significant. I just what I mean is it's not I don't think it's like the final voice. Um, I agree. I don't you. think there is a final voice. Yeah. Is what I'm saying. It's an all oh, maybe a, a kind of a question with a, no answer, an eternal, you know, quandary. But Claire, what you're describing is like open source. It's totally open open source art. Art, which uh, uh, I don't know. I always think of it as sort of an offering. You know, this is here it is. It's like I suppose like a Rorschach. Rorschach. I can't say that word. I have a strange block against it. <laughs> yes. Rorschach. Um, but you know, it's, 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 I always think about that because how I, I, I feel that in order to actually be art, my work has to be seen by others or does it, you know, that's something I think about. What do you th all think about that? Does it, is it art if it's not experienced by other people besides you? I tell students to make, oh, life. go ahead, go ahead. I, I used to always feel it's bad even to sell painting, and I felt I didn't want to taint it with money. But when I became a professional artist, I changed my mind drastically about this. Now it's very important for me to to connect to the audience and to also to to sell, have the works in the marketplace. Well, yeah, I mean, as I, I have to confess, as a deal, as an art dealer, you know, it's sometimes I think it sounds like, you know, drug dealer, like it's almost like a, a, a very pejorative term as an art dealer the, you always get this feeling where you sort of, you know, your heart is broken when you go into an artist's studio and there's tons of paintings and artwork stacked up because you think pe no one's seeing them, you know, if they're in storage, who's seeing them. So uh, I always think our artists want their work to be seen. Maybe not. Does anyone think they, I mean, I think it depends on the artist. I mean, Henry Darger and you don't want your work seen or you don't even know you have work. You know, but perhaps well, but the people, people, make the people work who don't want their work seen, you wouldn't know them, right? I mean, just by the nature of it. So we don't know those guys. Until they're, they are, Until they're dead. Until they're dead. Or, or not after that. But, you know, they die unknown and that's it. So there's a yeah, bias too. I, I feel strongly that this, yeah, this conversation uh, bothers me in some ways because I feel like people who make work don't always have to make it to be seen. I make work that I want to be seen and I make work that I don't want to be seen. Mm -hmm. And of course, again, we live in a capitalist market, but like, uh, I don't know how I got to the point and it's not like I sell that much work, but I, I don't, I made that performance about pleasure because I seek pleasure and fullness in my life. And like, if I want to try to sell work, I try to sell work. And if I don't, I don't. Right. And I think that's, that's a place that I'm trying to occupy in my life. That's different than a lot of other fine artists. And like, if I don't, if I make work that I want to sit in the studio because it's about trauma that I don't want to put out or show at a museum, then I don't do it. Um, and, and I think that's a place that I try to empower young artists to have like, sure. 
Like if you want to make certain types of work that you want to get out and you want it to be seen, then like, sure. But like, if you want to make work and let it sit in the studio and like me and Ayanna Moore had conversations about this, me and Colleen Smith, it's actually black radical films who actually taught me this. And they are some of the most looked over people in art in general. Um, but I think there's a way in which they have decided how they want their work to exist in the world. And but I, I mean, who's to say that I would get, I don't, I don't think that I get more pleasure from a, an exhibition of my work than I do from walking in a forest, for example. Like, I, I would say that I get more pleasure from walking in a forest. <laughs> so but I don't see know, why it's a, um, either or. Yeah. yeah. Why do you have to choose? Yeah. <laughs> Certainly not, but you know, it is, it is a material, you know, my work exists in the material world. So it's, you know, I make objects much of the time. So it's just a question that I'm pondering, you know, like I, am not sure. And I, Derek, I do really appreciate that um, perspective. I, I, I think I need to look into this more, <laughs> give up the object perhaps. <laughs> Yeah, the object is sexy. Like we make money. You know what I mean? Like the object is sexy. <laughs> it sells. It it's leaves. Problematic as fuck. It travels. Um, but I feel the same way. Like the, the brisk walk is much nicer than the exhibition. And I'm not turning down exhibitions. I mean, but yeah. I may not put I may not put an easily commodifiable artworks in an exhibition either. Yeah. But you know, you know- if yeah. it's a museum or it's a gallery and the relationship with the gallery. I mean, there's just a lot of things you have to navigate. Yeah. In, in a way, it's very, it's all very extravagant. I mean, that's how, but there's something very gratifying about, you know, sort of bringing people to places they've never been before, you know, and uh, creating conversations that have never happened before, whether it's, you know, the Mongolian artist in Germany or the Indonesian artists in Beijing, or the South African artists in Hong Kong. You know, it's very interesting to sort of uh, create that juxtaposition and watch people make a conversation and try and figure it out. And I think that's one of the pleasures of globalization that, you know, obviously I've missed over the last two years of COVID, but that, uh, that sort of cross-border almost... Uh, almost um, coincidental conversations, accidental conversations that happen when you're, uh, when we're able to travel more, I think is very important. I got a, I got excited about a, a, a road trip from LA to Seattle. I was like, yay, we have to go. <laughs> it's uh, I, I, I do think that's, that's one of the pluses of the art world generally is this sense of a, you know, conversation with anyone anywhere at any time is a, is a wonderful sort of informality, a charm, the charming informality of the art world. Here's, here's my question to everyone though. Like that is the charming thing about it, like the dialogue. And again, I wonder if we paid for the process and the dialogue and not the product, like the product is going to happen. Like the, the process is making the work. So like just supporting the dialogue is enough. Um, <laughs> No, I think so. The pro- It's more and more. I get more. You say, oh, I'd, I wish you could spend more time with the process and the dialogue and, and less time sort of, you know, selling the wares but if we, <laughs> to I survive. If we, restructure, if we could restructure the way in which we sell the object and instead sell the dialogue, get people to fund the way the artist thinks versus funding it through collecting an object that will like sit in a basement potentially. Right. I, but I, sometimes it, we think through objects. Yeah. I think we, we think, you know, I mean, the object is, exceeds the commodity and the, the art object, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not strictly a, a, a piece for the market. But do you think through the object or you think through making the object? Both. Well, both. Yeah. So, um, so the object is, um, it, it speaks in a way it, it encapsulates. It's like a, um, it's like a distillation or condensation of a process and of, um, 
of an orientation. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't argue that. I mean, you know, you make a lot of interesting objects and they are portals into a whole way of thinking and seeing the world. I guess I wish people would have funded my thoughts and not bought the object three years after I made it. Mm -hmm. You want the funding up front. I do. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually think that would actually be the progressive thing to do in the art world. Like, if, I guess we're here, you know, we're like, run the world, like the arts, the end and the beginning of it all. I'm like, if it's a new beginning, then like, let's restructure the way this works. We all agree that it's a problem. Yeah. It's a, it's a big problem of economic survival. I mean, for everybody, unless you're a billionaire, I think it's a huge problem. It's like the elephant in the room whenever you talk about the art world. So. Yes, it is. <laughs> Yeah. You pretend, you know, you pretend that there's not economics all involved in it. Yeah. Like that there's no stress from the economic survival elements. You know, you sort of and I think that the sort of stress of trying to survive economically in the art world is sort of the big elephant in the room that, you know, everyone tries to ignore and get on with their practice, get on with their work, but it's it's a big stress. So is, is there anything else anyone has to add? I feel like Julian's been very quiet. I mean, have you had issues with uh, your um, your sculpture and how it's perceived in the art world? I assume you have. Well, you know, I when I started out making these protein-inspired sculptures, I got in big trouble in my art school because people were telling me I make uh, models and I felt of them as sculptures. And so that was kind of my first, that kind of this, this you know, this kind of, you know, this, this thorn in my brain that, I, that, that was really triggering me. And, and I, I was asking myself, what is it that I feel artistic about it? Why is it not a model? Is, is there a hard line between those two? So that kind of started me on that process thinking that way. But then I was fortunate to kind of find galleries and, and be able to sell works and and at, at good price that allowed me living wage which you know kind of basically not made me think about this so much because that way when i can support my family i'm like i don't care you know i don't actually care you know the value of art because there's the money price tag which is a ridiculous metric obviously but th th what we pointed out before is there is no metric that really makes sense the whole idea of a metric is really alien to the art, to the idea of art, you know, art is a spiritual thing. It's not something in the, from the domain of science. And so, you know, I, at the end of the day, I don't really care all that much about value. You know, I see a value in some stuff in others. I don't, I'm beyond the point where I would judge, feel judgmental about it, but you know, it's really everybody's own cup of tea to me. Yeah. I kind of like to, to dwell or to linger in the moment before value is assigned, before like an outside, you know, kind of um, categorizing value can be assigned. And it, it feels like closer to the experience itself. Yeah, and that's also a very art, art thing, you know, before the interpretation, before we nail it and, and, and project it into a lower dimensional space, where the that's exciting. That's why we drive, right? But then is the inflation just a casualty of the continuation? The inflation as in what? Like you sell a piece, the work appreciates in a way, right? Like your prices have increased from when you first started selling them. So there yes. is a value as just to it the third time you made it or the fourth time you make it. So like is that just casualty of the the art market are we just like being like that's just what happens to our work because i think the value does come in when you make it the second time or the third time you know i try to stay passionate in my own work and i, I make additions so okay. but i have also a lot of people i work with and they actually do then the manufacturing so i i have like a system set up that treat, keeps me at that edge of being passionate or tries to be you know and and, and then there's this whole machinery that generates income to keep the ship afloat yeah, it's it's a difficult balance. It's a very very difficult balance. I don't know. Um, yes. You know, those those early moments when you 
sort of know an artist when he's before he's rich and famous <laughs> and he's just struggling uh you know the the chinese would they say that uh you know the best artwork comes from that time when people have to what they say eat bitterness you know when you have to eat Very bitterness true. before you, you, life becomes bourgeois and comfy and middle class but that you know in every sense of the word literal and figurative you have to eat bitterness that's when the best art comes but maybe that's a little too tough that's very buddhist you know the buddhists always say if you have to choose two paths always choose the most difficult one never choose the easy one you know so but uh it's uh i think i think we live in a time of of constant distraction and it's really hard to concentrate and spend time in people's with people in their studio whatever getting to know people that you know we're, we're all like butterflies we know a little bit about a lot of things and we just sort of touch the surface very superficially of a lot of topics a lot of you know media presentations media manipulations somehow we just touch the surface too much too much surface information and not going deep enough sometimes is uh maybe that's my perspective from a uh, coming from asia that people sort of touch the surface of what they don't know but don't go very deeply into those subjects is uh i don't want to end with me talk i'm i'm prefer to hear from you guys i know siri what are you working on next project i know siri is publishing a photo book which is great um what's the name of the press again charcoal press charcoal press they're very good yeah and what claire what are you working on beside your w lucky retirement <laughs> i'm trying to sort out um running a, a kind of art on space here in chicago nice congratulations yeah. claire that would be wonderful very exciting. That's great. Very i was really fortunate to teach in claire's last semester right yeah, yeah. Derek was a, a visiting artist in one of my classes. He came in, uh, he zoomed in, I zoomed in. and uh, lit their heads on fire. Wow. And Derek, what are you going to do when you get back to the States? What's your sort um, of next on your plate? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of insane. I have a show in May that I'm still kind of conceiving. Um, I have a film. I got a Sundance grant. Uh, last year, 